Mother's Day. What comes to mind when you think of Mother's Day? I wonder. One of the most embedded memories for me is of primary school. Primary school. Yes, I did go to school. Primary school in the 1960s. Yes, there was school in the 60s, Amy. We did actually go in the 60s. And the Mother's Day store. Who remembers the Mother's Day store? These days, some schools don't have Mother's Day school. Do you know that? They've got to have family stool, stall because it's too confronting to have Mother's Day. Thankfully, that's here and there in the school. And, of course, they get reported because it's so ridiculous. John's editorial. But Mother's Day stall. Who remembers you could buy the crocheted covered bar of soap? What a treasure. A lavender bag. Whoever got the lavender bag? Some fancy ribbons. Or if the budget was really extended, you could buy this little bottle of perfume for mum. Probably didn't smell very good, but mum would love it. And I remember my mum always used to make a big deal of our little school store presents. And what mum hasn't worn with pride, the Fruit Loop necklace (laughs) and the dyed macaroni necklace (laughs) to show that she knows that she's loved. More precious than any diamond (laughs) necklace, said no mother. (laughs) But, But we wear it with pride to bring joy to our kids. Well, I don't, but you do. And, uh, of course, time has marched on and um, uh, Josie and I have had our own special Mother's Day memories from our own kids and even now our grandkids. But whatever our personal memories are, whatever comes to your mind when you think of Mother's Day, I think it should be a day of thanksgiving. I think it should be a day of appreciation for our mothers, for their love, for their sacrifices... Uh, the guiding hand that has helped us bring us where we are today. <clears throat> Our mothers were not perfect any more than anyone here today is perfect. But their important role in our lives is undeniable. <clears throat> Thinking about Mother's Day surprises, well, about 2,000 years ago in the remote land of Judea, there was a young woman who was about to receive A big surprise and a wonderful gift. A surprise and a gift that was not only for her, but a gift to the whole world. And we've celebrated that today in our worship and in our communion. That woman was, of course, Mary, the mother of Jesus. Luke's Gospel records uh, Mary being informed by the angel Gabriel that God was going to have her bear, a, in a miraculous way, the saviour of the world. And she receives the news <coughs> with surprise, but still with great courage and faith, and then travels to the home of her cousin, Elizabeth, who is also miraculously with child, with the one who grew up to be John the Baptist. And on meeting her cousin, Elizabeth, Elizabeth affirms to Mary that the hand of God is in all these things. On a teenager finding herself pregnant without a husband, God's hand is upon this. And Mary, in response, sings a song of praise that encapsulates so much of what God is for us. So let me read that for you in Luke chapter 1 and verse 46 to 55. And Mary said, My soul glorifies the Lord, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Saviour, for he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. From now on, all generations will call me blessed, for the Mighty One has done great things for me. Holy is his name. His mercy extends to those who fear him from generation to to generation. He has performed mighty deeds with his arm. He has scattered those who are proud in their inmost thoughts. He's brought down rulers from their thrones, but has lifted up the humble. He has filled the hungry with good things, but has sent the rich away empty. 
He has helped his servant Israel, remembering to be merciful to Abraham and his descendants forever, even as he said to our fathers. Let's pray. Father God, as we come to just look into this song that Mary sang, Lord, we just pray that you would take the content of this song and the truths that are therein that we might apply them to our lives. For this is just not a song for 2,000 years ago. It's a song for 2024. The truths of it apply to us as much as they did to any recipient in the time that it was spoken. So, Lord, may your spirit be upon your word and may we receive it with thanksgiving and with joy in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just before the birth of Jesus, there was a great sense of expectation and hope. The scriptures had promised the coming of the Messiah. And the word was out that this was the time. This was the time. He was coming, they said, and he was coming to deliver Israel from their enemies. Very pertinent in that time because they were under oppression seems like Israel spent most of their history under oppression, but they certainly were at this time from the Romans. And uh, they were right about the timing. Jesus was coming. But little did they know that God's plan included the humility of a stable. They would never have guessed that. They would have thought a palace, but it was a stable. And a suffering saviour rather than a triumphant Alice, uh, Alex, the conqueror, Alexandra the Great on a horse. That was their picture. But God had something else in different. And not even, not even Mary could have fully understood the impact of this child she was carrying and uh, <clears throat> the echo of his life through the ages to this day. There's no more famous person in the history of the world. No more famous person. People are not aligned with anyone more than they're aligned with Jesus. And we know why. Mark Lowry is a Christian songwriter and he put this mystery to music in his song, Mary, Did You Know? You, I'm sure you have heard that song. I think we sing it every year at Christmas carols, don't we? And part of it says, Mary, <clears throat> did you know that your baby boy would one day walk on water. No, she didn't. <clears throat> Mary, did you know that your baby boy would save our sons and daughters? Well, maybe, but not in the way that happened. Did you know that, that your baby boy has come to make you new <clears throat> and this child that you delivered will soon deliver you? So let's look at some key statements made by Mary in her song that speak to us about... <clears throat> who God is and what he has done for us. And the first thing is, uh, uh, we'll, we'll highlight is verse 46, 47, where Mary says, My soul glorifies the Lord and my spirit rejoices in God, my Saviour. It's the first thing she sung. She begins by praising God for his salvation. Praising for his salvation. And this key point here is obviously... Forgiveness, because that is the basis of our need for a saviour. Why do I need a saviour? Because I need forgiveness. We need forgiveness of our sins. And Mary understood this truth. The truth of this good news of God bringing forgiveness into the world inspires her to worship. Mary's song has been called the Magnificat from the opening words in the Latin translation. But it's full of quotes from the Old Testament, from Genesis and from Job, from the Psalms and from Isaiah. Now Mary was probably about 15 years of age at this time, 15, 16. So it's quite amazing to see the spiritual death, depth and maturity that she had as such a young Jewish girl. But not surprising because the girls did learn as well 
uh, in their homes as the boys did. So she had quite a depth of understanding. And clearly she loved God and clearly she loved God's word. She drew upon it as she sang this song. She understood, Mary understood, that she did not deserve this special privilege of being the mother of Messiah. Clearly her words, she understands that. She said, he has been mindful of the humble state of his servant. Mary wasn't exalted in herself. She recognised her humility. As it says on the slide there, she was a special person. Yes, absolutely. Unique. She'd been faithful in her obedience and love to God. Yes, but she still needed a saviour. She still needed a saviour and she knew it. Mary affirms this when she says, she says, not my spirit rejoices in God, when she says, My spirit rejoices in God, my Saviour. Not God, the Saviour. Think about it. Mary said, My spirit rejoices in God, my Saviour. She didn't need a Saviour. If she was sinless, say, God, the Saviour. Everyone else, but not for me. But she knew she needed a Saviour. She needed a Saviour like we all do. She understood this baby would be her saviour as well as the saviour of the whole world. He would bring forgiveness to the human family, to everyone who lives. And uh, she worshipped and gave thanks for the forgiveness that would come through Jesus. As we must do, of course. Another statement she made in that song was, He has performed mighty deeds. He has performed mighty deeds. And this speaks to us of victory and of overcoming. The miraculous mighty deeds that God was doing through Jesus was going to turn the world right side up. It was going to turn the world right side up. He would overcome the corrupted world system. Now we know we don't see it in its fullness at this time. We, don't, we won't see it in its fullness until Jesus returns. But we see pockets of it, don't we? Here and there. We see that the, the, the persistent evil of some regimes always comes to an end. Have you noticed that? No matter how powerful, even if they can manage it for centuries in some case, eventually God says, enough, no more. Many people say, Germany should have won the Second World War. We should all be eating sauerkraut. But miraculously, they did not. But they should have. And, uh, you know, you look at it in other regimes that have fallen almost out of nowhere. Think about the, the coming down of the Iron Curtain. The, the, that came, no one saw it coming. One moment, it's this impenetrable Soviet Union. Fast forward five years from that position or even three and it was gone. It was gone, it was dissolved and countries regained their independence. God comes to a point where God says, that's it. No despotic realm ever can do it because what they're doing is they're trying to perpetuate evil and you can't perpetuate evil in God's world. It will come to an end at some point and then it will ultimately come to an end when Jesus returns as we all no. Said Jesus, God and Jesus would turn the tables on the wrongs of the world. As she said, the proud and the arrogant who have power in this world to oppress others would be scattered by God. Unjust rulers would be pulled down from their thrones and humble servants would be put in their place. Those who use their wealth to oppress the poor would live in spiritual hunger while those who were the poor of the world would be filled with the good things of God. And all this would take place because of what Jesus would do. And Jesus even spoke of this, didn't he, in the Sermon on the Mount and in other teachings. So Jesus would give and always has given the downtrodden reason to rejoice. 
We think even a very contemporary picture of the oppression of black people in America. Horrible, terrible oppression. And what was it that gave them hope for a better day? Do you know? Was the Christian faith that they largely adopted, even in their slavery, filtered through from their masters, but they adopted that and that gave them hope for a better day. And through Martin Luther, uh, Martin Luther King and others, that better day came. I'm not saying that racial relations are perfect in, in the United States, but they're not, there's no slaves anymore. And they were liberated largely through the gospel. And the same is true in Great Britain. They were Christian giants who overcame slavery. It came an end, an end to global slavery. Jesus is the one who turns wrong things right way up. And also in what um, comes out in Mary's there, that Jesus came regardless of our status. Paul even said, not many of you are this and that and big deals, you know, but Jesus has come for you. Jesus has come for you. Status is irrelevant. The humble of heart are valued by God. And so are the arrogant, by the way, but their pathway is to become humble, to know God. God loves the arrogant as much as he loves the humble, but there's a pathway of humility for them before they can really know Jesus, before they can know God's love, before they can get right with him. The oppressed find mercy and help. And again, we've seen that played out in the world. <clears throat> and again, there's an option there for the strong can admit, admit their weakness outside of God and find real strength. The point of all this is that anyone can come to God on his terms. Anyone can come to God on his terms. Never on our own. Not the way we shape God. There's a great attempt, even in the church some ways, to shape God in the image of culture. It'll never work. It'll never work. You can't shape God in the image of culture. Culture has to come under God like everything else. It has to. And that's why churches who have tried to make culture over God are dwindling. Nobody wants to go. Why would you want to go? Why do you want to go to a thing that's just a carbon copy of the world and lacking all, all spiritual power? No one wants to go. You know, <clears throat> the world may not like our viewpoint, but they're not going to come to a church that adopts their viewpoint. Do you know that? And that's historically been proven. The churches that are disappearing and will disappear, sadly, are those who try to embrace the ungodliness of our culture. It's never going to work. So don't, I know you're not expecting it, but don't expect this church is one day going to say this is okay and that's okay and that's okay and that's... It's not going to happen. It won't happen. Because God's word must be paramount. It must be the standard. Otherwise, what are you left with? This, we don't want this church to become a smorgasbord, spiritual smorgasbord, where we take from this book or we take from that verse and we take from that verse. Oh, we're not, not, I don't like to eat that one. It's, we're not going to do that. And I know you don't want me to do that or us to do that. So I said, make, make no mistake about it. There is a right side up. The world would make us believe that there's no right side up. It's what... Why can't you just let people be whatever they want to be, John, and just do whatever they want to do? Funny, the Bible talks about that. There was a time before the judges where everyone did what was right in his own eyes. Didn't go well. <laughs> it was a very destructive time for Israel because they lacked direction, they lacked leadership. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes and that is a recipe for a mess. 
That's why our culture is so many places in a mess because everyone wants to do what's right in their own eyes. You know, I'm 80 kilo, still fairly fit guy and if I want to, I can go and play netball against 45 kilo women because I think I should be able to. Now we laugh because it's ridiculous but it's being embraced. And thankfully, I'm so grateful, now that at last there's a pushback. That American swimmer who, the male swimmer who won all those girls' races has had all his things taken off him and wow, they've gone to the, the girl, the woman, who comes second to him. Justice. It's happened, folks. Enough people said, hey, this is ridiculous. And you know, Sometimes I'm frightened and thought that one day, it probably happen more in this country than probably in America now, that we'll allow some man to play in a girl's football game and some girl is going to get seriously injured or killed because girls were not designed to play football with men. With men. Anyway, you all know that. So it's not enough just to say, I love God and just live however we want to live. And that's what the world wants to say. So you can say you love God, John, church, vision, but don't say things we don't like and don't try to live in a way that we don't like. Now, the day may come when it gets very pressing, but thankfully it's not here now. But Jesus said, I'm the way, the truth and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me through his way, through his method, through his word. He's never gonna, Jesus is never going to rewrite the script or the rule, but he's never going to do it. And we can love everyone who believes otherwise, and we do. But love does not translate into having to embrace what we do not believe. That just doesn't make any sense. And the good news is that the life given over to Jesus is ultimately victorious one. He has performed mighty deeds. Jesus said, take heart, I've overcome the world. Yeah. Praise God, he's already happened. He's overcome the world. And we're recipients of that victory. Finally, she said he has helped his servant Israel. So after exalting the forgiveness and the victory that we have, Mary sang of God's faithfulness, particularly to the covenant that he's made. Do you hear that? God has spelled out the covenant. He spelled out the truth. He spelled out how he relates and it's a covenant. He made it. We can't change it. God has helped his servant Israel. So it speaks very clearly of covenant, the faithfulness of God to his promises. Covenant is important because it means that God will keep his promises even when it looks like nothing is happening. 400 years, time Jesus came, you may or may not know this, for the previous 400 years, there'd been no word from God. It's called uh, the silent 400 years, strangely enough. <laughs> silent 400 years. No prophetic word, no rising of a prophet, 400 years. And then John the Baptist comes, he's the first one. So, People have got used to not hearing anything. But even when it looks like nothing's happening, even in our life, God is still at work. The understanding that we are in covenant with God reassures us, and, and I, like you, I need reassurance sometime too, that I'm in covenant with something that's bigger than myself. I'm glad it's not my job to sort this mess out. I really do. I don't go to bed at night thinking, how can I solve the world's problems? My own little problems are enough. I'll do my best with them. But I'm thankful that God is God and I am not. And uh, we're, we're all part of something much bigger than ourselves. And God has bound himself to us in loving faithfulness. He's made promises to us and he's committed himself to those promises. And that's good news. That's good news for all of us. Jeremiah 31 says, 
This is the covenant I will make with the house of Israel after that time, declares the Lord. I will put my law in their minds and write it on their hearts. I will be their God and they will be my people. Good New Testament verse written in the Old Covenant. But that's what Jesus came to do. The Holy Spirit write his law upon our hearts. God has committed to himself to us with an immutable bond. He is on our side. He is for us, the scripture says. He is not against us. Psalm 25 says, The Lord confides in those who fear him. He makes his covenant known to them. So being in covenant with God means we're partakers of pretty much every good thing. God is not stingy. He gives freely, gives freely. And in that we're obviously not just speaking of material blessing, even though that's included, but joy and peace and fellowship and health and ultimately a place in eternity that will surpass every earthly treasure. Every earthly treasure. And I've said it so many times, you're probably tired of me saying it, but none of us are going to walk through that door into eternity and say, is this it? None of us are going to have that reaction. Like that song, I can't remember who wrote it, but a contemporary Christian song, will we be able to speak at all? I can only imagine. Be able to speak at all. But none of us are going to be disappointed. If you're concerned about that, put your concerns away. <laughs> you're not going to be disappointed. You won't have missed out on anything. So, oh, you know, if I'd, I'd been a little bit worldly, I might have got a better car. You're not, going to, you're not going to be disappointed. You're not going to be disappointed. You know, if I'd just fudged my taxes a bit more, I might have got a bit better, bigger house. You're not going to be disappointed. You're not going to be disappointed with anything that we think be laid down to follow Jesus more fully. You will count it all, as Paul said, done. loss. Done. Yes, he did say literally done. You're right. I used the cleaned up version. Loss. But that's what it literally says, and which means it literally says something else. But uh, it will count it all as loss, as loss. Nobody looks back and says, oh, I wish I had more done. <laughs> no one. No one says that. No one's going to say that. Because God is good, and all he's got to give to us is goodness. So on this Mother's Day... Uh, we certainly do celebrate our mothers. We said that, but uh, it's even better and uh, more appropriate to take this song of Mary, the most famous of all mothers, and rejoice with her in all that God has done. Rejoice and worship him for his forgiveness. What a precious gift. Rejoice and worship him for the victory that he gives us which overcomes the world overcomes the world and rejoice and worship him for the unshakable covenant with us. That means he's going to do everything that he said he will do. Now may our response be something like Mary's who said, Lord, here is my life. I will do your will as your grace enables me. Make me your servant. We can lay hold of that can lay hold of that. Amen. Let's stand together. Let's pray. <clears throat> Father God, we do thank you for your forgiveness, for your victory, for your covenant to us. Lord, these are so much uh, of precious value in our lives. Lord, sometimes this world wants to beat us down and beat us up, push us around, change our thinking. But Lord, we hold on to you. We choose to hold on to you. We choose to hold on to your word. We choose to hold on to your testimony to us. Amen. And Lord, we also choose to love those who think differently, who feel differently, who act differently. We love them, Lord. Give us grace to love them as you love them. But Lord, let not our love for people be some kind of an excuse to step away from your declared purposes. So that would be wrong. So Lord, help us to graciously walk this path we're on 
full of grace, full of love in this world. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Just before we uh, break, we've got a lovely morning tea there. Thank you, Amy and Josie, for preparing those lovely Mother's Day treats. We had a little Mother's Day store down there. And Amy and Josie prepared those for us. So thank you, Amy. <coughs> Josie. <coughs> And, uh, yeah, enjoy some fellowship. Let's flip some chairs around so we've got plenty of room up the back there.